Welcome to the Adult Obesity Guidelines webinar series hosted by the Office of Lifelong Learning and the Physician Review Program and Obesity Canada. My name is Denise campbell Sharer. I'm the Associate Dean for the Office of Lifelong Learning and Physician Review Program, as well as a family physician here at the University of Alberta. It was my great pleasure to serve on the executive of the Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines. New clinical practice guidelines are expansive, 19 chapters on a wide range of topics related to obesity diagnosis and management, weight bias and more all written by Canada's top researchers, health practitioners, and patient advisors. The first truly patient-centered guidelines and the result of more than three years of hard work. Just before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories across Canada of the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. So with that, it's my very great pleasure to um, welcome Dr. Laurie Twells here today to present on epidemiology and adult obesity. Dr. Laurie Twells is a professor of, in the Faculty of Medicine at Memorial University in Newfoundland. She's a clinical epidemiologist with additional expertise in health economics and health policy. Dr. Twells is currently conducting research in the areas of epidemiology of obesity in Canada, the impact of bariatric surgery on long-term health outcomes, obesity and fertility, maternal obesity and asthma, weightless prioritization for bariatric surgery, early infant nutrition and its impact on child and maternal health, and theory-based applications to support healthy behavior change. Lori has been a member of Obesity Canada since 2009 and was a member of the steering committee and an author of the 2020 clinical, Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines, as well as a science committee member for the Obesity Canada report cards in 2017 and 2019. So welcome, Laurie. Thank you, Denise. I'm delighted to be part of the webinar series on the very exciting newly released Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines on Obesity Management and Treatment. And as many of us will know, uh, the CMA just released their top 25 most read articles in 2020 in obesity in adults. The Clinical Practice Guidelines came in at number one. So uh, that's a very exciting amidst a year of unprecedented change regarding the pandemic. And many of those articles are, are of course, related to the, to the pandemic and COVID-19, but the obesity guidelines topped number one. So that was uh, very exciting for many of us. As Denise said, I'm going to be talking to you about the epidemiology of adult obesity in Canada. This is one of the chapters in the newly released clinical practice guidelines. So the outline for the presentation is really just to touch on obesity as a chronic disease. Um, as many of us know, the, uh, guide, these current guidelines have really taken the stance that obesity is a chronic disease as a starting point and should be treated as a chronic disease in terms of health interventions. Um, and over the last six or seven years, a number of key organizations have actually endorsed obesity as a chronic disease, including the American Medical Association in 2013, the Canadian Medical Association in 2015, the Saskatchewan Medical Association in 2015, the Yukon Medical Association in 2019, and most recently, the Ontario Med Medical Association in 2020. Um, Obesity Canada continues to help advocate with other provinces in terms of moving this resolution towards obesity as a chronic disease in the remaining provinces and territories. And we are certainly moving and hoping to move towards that in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador as well. I'll then move on to talking a little bit about the epidemiology of obesity in Canada um, and show you some of the data that we have out of Canada from Statistics Canada. Talk a little bit about the key messages for policymakers and healthcare providers, and then touch on the key recommendations that are published in the guidelines in relation to policy and healthcare providers. So as most of us know, obesity is a prevalent, complex, progressive and relapsing chronic disease. It is characterized by the presence of excessive and or dysfunctional adipose tissue that impairs health and well-being. People living with obesity face systemic bias and stigma within the healthcare system and society, which in turn contributes to increased morbidity and mortality. Obesity care should be based on evidence-based principles of chronic disease management, similar to other chronic diseases for example, hypertension or type two diabetes. People living with obesity should have access to evidence-based interventions, such as medical nutrition therapy, physical activity, pharmacotherapy, and bariatric surgery. 
Obesity care must validate patients' lived experiences and move beyond simplistic approaches of move more and eat less. So in terms of the epidemiology, obesity has been most often defined using measures we are all very familiar with, body mass index or BMI, a derived index which is, comes from measuring height and weight. The index itself is a height in kilograms divided by meters and meters squared. A BMI exceeding 30 describes obesity with further subclassifications into class one between 30 and 34.9, class two, 35 to 39.9, and class three, greater than 40. The subclassifications have come about due to the research that has shown that with increased BMI, there is also increased health risk. Waist circumference is another common measure used to define obesity, and threshold cutoff values have also been come across from the research as well. These are associated with increased health risk. A waist circumference greater than 102 centimeters in men and more than 88 centimeters in women increases health risk. At the population level, health complications from excess body fat increase as BMI and waist circumference increase. Although it's very important to note that this is primarily for the use of epidemiological or research studies. BMI and waist circumference have significant limitations when used solely to manage an individual with obesity. An individual with an elevated BMI or elevated waist circumference may not be in poor health. And this is one of the things that the clinical practice guidelines demonstrates. So again, just showing a table in, in relation to the increasing health risk, what you can see here is as your BMI increases in terms of the, those categories of one, two, and three, you can see that the health risk also increases. BMIs greater than 35 are often referred to as people living with severe obesity, and the risk in health increases exponentially. Obesity increases the risk of a number of serious chronic illnesses, such as cardiovascular disease, a number of cancers, including colon, kidney, and postmenopausal breast cancer, diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, osteoarthritis, chronic pain, and gout. When we look at the actual body in terms of obesity, obesity can affect a number of the systems in the body. A couple of the areas that are, seem to be actually increasing in terms of prevalence and burden in terms of the research right now in particular are non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which has been termed a twin epidemic along with obesity, as well as issues around infertility. Uh, one in three of our patients that actually access our fertility services clinic here have a BMI greater than 30. Obesity impacts people's lives. Health-related quality of life is significantly lower for individuals living with obesity compared to the general population due to impairments that include increased anxiety and depression, problems with pain and discomfort, reduced mobility, decreased vitality or energy, and reduced self-esteem. Obesity is associated with increased premature mortality and can reduce life expectancy by between 6 and 14 years. For each five kilogram meter squared increase in BMI greater than 25, there is a 30% increased risk of all cause mortality. This shows itself in a dose response relationship, providing evidence for a cause and effect relationship, especially for BMIs greater than 35. This just shows you some data um, from a, a large study, the Prospective Studies Collaboration Study published in 2009 in The Lancet where they analyzed BMI and all-cause mortality in 900,000 adults across a number of countries that included Europe, the USA, Israel, Australia, and Japan. 57 prospective studies were included in this analysis with 13 years of follow-up. The number of deaths or outcomes were just over 66,000. Adjusting for age, sex, and smoking, the risk of mortality increased by 30% with every incre increment of a five kilogram per meter squared increase in BMI, both for ischemic heart disease and stroke. And what you can really see here in this data is that there is very much what's referred to as a U or J-shaped curve when we look at BMI and all-cause mortality. 
um, in particular around cardiovascular disease, where you'll actually see the increase actually goes up exponentially after a BMI of 30. The worldwide prevalence of obesity has nearly doubled in the last four decades. The prevalence of obesity has increased from 5% in 1980 to 10% in 2015 in men, and from 8.9% to 14.8% in women. In low-income countries, obesity is higher among middle-aged adults from wealthy and urban environments, especially women. But in high-income countries, obesity affects both sexes and all ages, though it does disproportionately affect disadvantaged groups with a lower socioeconomic status. It is estimated that 57.8% of the global population, close to 60%, will be affected by overweight or obesity by 2030. This is staggering. In Canada, the prevalence of obesity in adults rose dramatically, increasing threefold since 1985. In 2016, obesity affected 26.4% or one in four Canadians, equating to 8.3 million Canadian adults. Severe obesity, the fastest growing obesity subgroup, increased disproportionately over the same time period. In 2016, severe obesity affected an estimated 1.9 million Canadian adults. And as you can see from that previous gap, graph, actually severe obesity infers the greatest health risk on Canadian adults. In 2016, overweight affected 34% or one in three adults in Canada, additional 10.6 million individuals. Over the last four decades, abdominal obesity has also increased significantly, measured primarily by waist circumference. These increases are also associated with significant increases in health risk due to the surrogate measure of abdominal obesity and the location of potential body fat. The waist circumference threshold cutoff values are used to assess this health risk as well. Greater than a waist circumference greater than 102 centimeters in men and greater than 88 centimeters in women infers health risk. Using these cutoffs from Canadian health surveys conducted by Statistics Canada in 1981, 1988, and 2007, 2009, the prevalence of abdominal obesity increased from 11.4% to 14.2% to a staggering 35.6% respectively. 1.3 Canadian adults will be defined as having abdominal obesity using those threshold cutoffs. This data illustrates that the obesity phenotype or what people look like may be changing. This is a, a couple of graphs coming up showing you some of the data that's collected in Canada by Statistics Canada. This data has been collected relatively consistently since the early 1980s. Um, so we can actually use this data to sh certainly show trends related to obesity prevalence and overweight prevalence across the last three or four decades. As you can see here, the data shows you the different obesity subclasses, obesity one, two, and three, with an overall obesity as the light blue mark, a light blue uh, color, as well as the overweight as well. This really shows you that the prevalence of obesity has increased from about 6% in Canada to in 1985 to between 20 and 26 percent in Canada in 2016, which is our most recent data published. The difference here is really showing you that measured data obviously shows the prevalence of obesity as being much higher than when we actually just calculate the prevalence of obesity using self-report data. Self-report data meaning coming from surveys where we're asking people their heights and their weights actual data comes when we actually go out to these communities and measure people in terms of heights and weights. The prevalence of severe obesity using this data has increased from 1%, only 1% 1 in 1985, to 6% in 2015, 2016. This again is just a Canadian uh, figure that was published a number of years ago by Carolyn Gote and UBC, just showing the prevalence of obesity across the country this data was actually calculated for the, took into consideration the difference between self-report and actual data, and can show you the prevalence of obesity in particular across Canada. What's interesting here is that there's no real consistent pattern. We do have higher levels of obesity on the East Coast with very low levels on the West Coast, 
BC. Um, but really in between, it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of the prevalence of obesity with higher rates in the middle provinces, the prairie provinces with some lower rates around the prairie provinces in Alberta and Ontario and Quebec. What's most concerning when we look at the prevalence data is actually then calculating the percentage of change over time. So as you can see, in terms of the severe obesity, although it was the lowest in terms of prevalence, going from one to 6% from 1985 to 2016, those two lines now hit the top of the chart when we look at percentage change. That's where the real change has taken place in Canada is in that prevalence of severe obesity, adults living with a BMI greater than 35. Obesity is also still increasing in, in terms of the overall prevalence of obesity regarding a BMI greater than 35. This has increased by 300% over this time period, while severe obesity has increased by 455%. This again is just a, a graph showing you the prevalence of severe obesity in Canada. And again, looking at those differences, they very much mirror the prevalence of obesity uh, that I showed in the earlier figure where we have the higher rates of severe obesity on the East Coast, uh, lower rates on the West Coast, but again, a little bit of a mixed bag in between. This figure shows you the regional uh, variations in self-report and actual data that we see across the country. Really what I'm just trying to demonstrate here is the importance of collecting both self-report and actual data. Obviously actual data takes more resources to collect in terms of going out into the population and measuring people in terms of heights and weights and waist circumference. And that's not done very often, it's done periodically. Uh, we often collect this data through self-report. Um, just using Quebec as an example, you can see that in 2015, which is the red uh, bar, bar, uh, bar here, you can see the difference between the self-report, which is the lower bar that would give you the prevalence of obesity at 17%, but when we actually look at the measured data, it's 24%. What we've just de uh, de determined over time using this research is that we can actually use a calculation um, formula to in fact work out the difference between the two so that we don't always have to calculate or go out and collect measured data, but it is important to get some measured data in terms of the representative uh, re representativeness of what's going on across the country. This graph again just shows you some of the regional variations that have come from some of the data published by Statistics Canada in terms of the prevalence of overweight being the blue bar and the obesity subclasses of one, two, and three. Apart from BC, in all provinces in Canada, the majority of adults, meaning greater than 50%, are living with overweight or obesity. In BC, the prevalence is just under 50%. And the trends for BC going forward are also to be over 50% in the next 10 years. As or as more concerning is the increase in childhood obesity as it mirrors the adult trend. This is particularly concerning as obesity tends to track through the life cycle. What this means is that if children are obese at a young age and through to adolescence, they are highly likely to remain obese as they go through life. One in three children and or youths between six to 17 years have overweight or obesity. An increase, from, an increase from one in four in the late 70s. The prevalence of obesity among boys, in particular adolescent boys between 12 and 17 years, is significantly higher than for adolescent girls, 16.2 versus 9.3%. And this has been an area of concern in much research recently. The causes of and contributors to obesity are complex and extend well beyond an individual's choice over calories in and calories out. Established contributors to obesity include socioeconomic status, sex, ethnicity, access to healthcare, regional food and built environments, place of residence and genetics. For example, individuals with lower levels of education, income, and income are, are at a higher risk of developing obesity, in particular in high income countries. Men are more likely to be overweight, while women are more likely to be affected by obesity. Obesity risk varies across the country, as I've shown with those graphs earlier. <laughs> 
Other contributors within our environment increase the risk of developing obesity, such as medication use, chronic stress, insufficient sleep, decreased smoking rates, and the use of technologies. Many of these factors are associated with small changes in appetite or energy expenditure and demonstrate secular trends that mirror the rise in obesity. Several pharmaceuticals used for treating comorbidities commonly associated with obesity, such as depression, hypertension, and diabetes are known to promote weight gain. Thus patients can find themselves in a paradoxical situation in that treatment for their obesity related conditions also exacerbates their obesity. Obesity affects individuals, families, and society, and the economic burden is significant. In 2014, the global economic impact of obesity was estimated to be US 2 trillion or 2.8% of the world's global gross domestic product. In Canada, obesity and its related illnesses result in a large cost to society estimated to be Canadian 7.1 billion in 2010. And we haven't had any more recently published data on the cost of obesity in Canada. These costs are due to increases in direct costs related to increases in physician consultations, hospital use and emergency room visits, as well as increases in indirect costs related to lost productivity or presenteeism at work, meaning being at work and present, but not as productive as you would be, absenteeism or days off and obesity related disability, i.e. reduced mobility or increased pain. Measures of BMI and waist circumference describe obesity and examine changes in health status and risk at a population level over time. This data is required to determine the burden of disease and where to allocate scarce resources at a population level. But healthcare professionals should not rely solely on BMI or waist circumference to predict an individual's health risk, but use other screening and assessment tools to determine obesity risk, such as the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. Healthcare professionals and policymakers must understand the complex etiology of obesity has contributed to pervasive bias and stigma in the healthcare system and society. And this complexity has hindered progress in managing obesity as a chronic disease. Successful management, that is the prevention, management and treatment of obesity requires a collective effort at the policy, health system, community and individual level. There is a need for continued and focused investment in research funding to support the scientific understanding of obesity. This includes non-experimental research on the bio, psychosocial, and environmental causes and contributors to obesity, and experimental research to develop and test interventions to prevent, manage, and treat obesity. Research on how best to implement the evidence-based practice guidelines and inform policies, programs, and practice is now a priority. These were some of the key recommendations that came from this chapter that were published in the clinical practice guidelines. Healthcare providers are encouraged to recognize and treat obesity as a chronic disease, as we know, caused by abnormal or excess body fat that impairs health and results in increased risks of morbidity and premature mortality. The management of obesity in adults can be informed by the evidence informed strategies at the health system and policy level very similar to the chronic disease management of other chronic diseases, and continued longitudinal national and regional surveillance of obesity that includes both self-reported and measured data may or should continue to be collected on a regular basis in order to monitor trends over time in the population and evaluate the impact of changes in policies, programs, and clinical practice on obesity prevalence. Thank you. That's the end of that chapter. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists that are going to be joining us for the discussion today. Uh, so Dr. Sean Wharton, who is one of the co-leads of the um, executive for the guidelines, uh, is here with us and he has a doctorate in pharmacy and medicine. He's the medical director of the Wharton Medical Clinic a community-based internal medicine, weight management, and diabetes clinic 
He is an adjunct professor at McMaster University in Hamilton, New York University in Toronto. He also works as an internist at Women's College Hospital and the Hamilton Health Sciences Center. Uh, he's a researcher and is qualified as a diplomat of the American Board of uh, Obesity Medicine. And Dr. Jimena Ramos Salas uh, is also joining us. Um, she has a PhD in public health with a specialization in health promotion, uh, associate behavioral sciences from the uh, University of Alberta. Uh, she works as a director of research and policy at Obesity Canada and also works as a research and policy consultant with the European Association for the Study of Obesity and is a technical obesity consultant with the World Health Organization in the regional office for Europe. So welcome, Sean, welcome, Hemena. Uh, and just, we are a small group today actually um, on the call. So if any of the attendees would like to unmute to ask questions, um, just raise your hands and Melanie in the background will unmute you. Um, but uh, just maybe some reaction from our panelists um, uh, with regards to what Laurie was sharing, if you wanna kick us off. Yeah, ter terrific. Thank you very much, Lori. That was that was excellent, and the overview was great to see what it, uh, how things have changed, how we are, um, uh, how the world is is. We're going to see a different change within the potentially the countries that have topped out, and then the um, developing world. Uh, um, and I know we don't like to call it the developing world. Now, how obesity is going to be a major factor and challenge there. Maybe I could ask you that, like, like, what are your thoughts or, or do, do you think that we'll see obesity become a major factor in, in other countries, um, uh, even more so than in, in, in within the first world? Or are they going to catch up? Is it going to be a major problem? What are your thoughts there? Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, Yes, I think, I mean, I guess when you look at the, I guess what's interesting I find in terms of just looking at the epidemiology in Canada and then other countries around the world is that the causes and contributors are quite different, uh, which makes it interesting and complex in a lot of ways. So there's no sort of just true tested relationship between what causes obesity in different places and what you find in some of the, as you refer to more of the developing countries or, or lower income or middle income countries is that actually the, the, the population is different in terms of who's developing obesity. So for example, here, although we do have one in three adults that we really would probably define as, as having or being affected by obesity, um, we do have some of the subgroups that are more at risk in terms of marginalized and, and, and people of lower socioeconomic status. Whereas in some of the high or the low and middle income countries, what you find is actually it's people of higher incomes and higher education, in fact, who are developing obesity. And countries like Africa, for example, are often dealing with the two, two epidemics of one of malnutrition and one of obesity. So I think we will see increases in obesity in, in other countries globally. We certainly haven't, the, the trends and the forecasting is not showing that we've seen any major progress in a number of countries. Um, there is suggestion that in Canada, some of the, the prevalence of obesity using the definitions as I've shown that we do use for epidemiological studies is in some ways maybe leveling out or the percentage change may be slowing down. But then we're also seeing the increase in abdominal obesity measured by waist circumference as increasing. And as we do know that location of body fat around the abdominal region or visceral region can be actually more put people more at health risk than, for example, a body mass index. Um, and clinically, we know this all has to really be rooted in, in looking at the impairment of health, and it's not always the case with these measures. So I do think we will see increases globally in obesity, yes, yet to come. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. Jimena, did you yeah. want to weigh in on that? Well, what's interesting from uh, Lori's presentation, which was great, thank you so much for that presentation, is that... Um, you know, the, the, the data you showed where the severity of the disease has progressed uh, in Canada um, and the discussions that uh, we are having here at the World Health Organization. And we've done studies that show that none of the uh, WHO member states are really on track in terms of achieving their voluntary targets to reduce non-communicable diseases, including obesity levels in adults and children. So nobody in the world, no country in the whole world is on target to reducing the levels of obesity in childhood and adults. And in fact, some countries have even less than 10% of even 
trying to achieve that goal. And so Canada is not in a unique position globally uh, when we see those increases in the prevalence of severity of obesity. But I think that also really, uh, from my perspective, raises the issue and the advocacy issue that we do need to treat this disease as a, as a serious disease. And uh, we cannot really wait any longer because it's not that the levels of under, uh, overweight are increasing. It's actually the severity of the disease that is progressing that we need to do something about. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that's excellent, uh, Jimena. It's good to hear that just from the WHO perspective as well. Um, what's interesting is so many countries have had targets, uh, including our province here in Newfoundland has had a target to reduce, reduce obesity by 2025. The target means nothing. Um, so I guess what I would say is in terms of the what's happening in Canada, I mean, we have now got what we would probably refer to as a new intervention, the clinical practice guidelines. So we could argue that nothing's changed over the last two or three or four decades when really not much has changed. We, we've never treated obesity as a chronic disease. Um, there's very little uh, ability to do so in many of the provinces when it comes to payment schedules, for example. And, and we did a review a number of years ago um, in a number of the provinces, you, you can't charge for looking after somebody with just obesity. It's always got to be the associated illnesses. So there's really been no focus. So I think that will be interesting because I know with the new clinical practice guidelines really pushing the science and the rationale and the evidence for obesity being a chronic disease, a number of the provinces that are now pushing that resolution forward, and I've been on a couple of calls recently, um, now we then have to work out how to implement that. So if you actually uh, put the resolution through in a province that obesity is a chronic disease, how will physicians and other healthcare provisioner, pro uh, professionals bill for that? Um, and I know that's something that we are, we're talking about here because I'm very much advocating for our medical association to push that forward and speaking with two CEOs here in our regional health authorities. And that's been one of their questions to me is, we can push it, we can get a resolution forward, but what does it mean practically? So it'll be interesting to see, you know, the research around the implementation of the guidelines, I think is critical, but we're also at a point in our, in our graph where we may eventually be able to show clinical practice guidelines of 2020 in Canada, and maybe we start to see some changes because really we've seen nothing this dramatic before in terms of a potential intervention. Yeah. Laurie, that's fantastic. Can you comment a little bit about in Canada, the state of the data? I know here in Alberta, we were looking um, to try to calculate EOS um, across the population. And we mm -hmm. were only actually able to do it in the, the Sipson data, in the Canadian mm -hmm. Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance data, because we actually couldn't get um, weights and heights on patients mm -hmm. out of the administrative data sets for Alberta. So. Could you comment nationally on the data landscape and, and how that um, is or isn't supporting the work that you're doing around really trying to map the magnitude of the problem? Yeah, so one of the issues I guess that you often come across with data, uh, well, first of all, you often see presentations even on obesity in North America really dominated by US data, first of all, um, because the US has had their two systems running for decades now, the NHANES data, which many of us will be familiar with, and their BRF, BRFSS data. One really does measures um, and one is self-reported. And, and you often see North American just pa packaged as, as one country almost, and we see the American data. Canadian data, we do have good statistics Canada data. Um, it goes back to the sort of late 70s, early 80s. Um, it's, I mean, I would say it's, it's limited in that it's small samples from each province. It's meant to be representative, but of course, when you get into a representative sample of data in a province, once you start, for example, looking at obesity, which I did a number of years ago for my doctoral work, you find that it's fine to look at, say, BMI is greater than 30, where again, you would have self-reported heights and weights, but very difficult to look at the subclassifications because you're into just small sample sizes. Um, so again, I guess the Statistics Canada data is good. We don't have great provincial data, no. So I mean, that will give you a provincial sample. Um, it's something you can look at getting in terms of accessing Stats Can data, it's free. Um, there's a process to go through. You might have a research data center at your uh, university, which I'm sure you would do, 
um, where you can access that data. But again, you will be looking at self-report data for the most part. Every few years, Statistics Canada comes out to the provinces and territories. I've seen them here in, the, in a mobile van and they do measures. So they do things like blood pressure, um, they do some blood work, they will take actual heights and weights, for example, they'll do waist circumference. But again, they're very small samples. Um, so in terms of determining the EOS, you really need that comorbidity profile in order to determine the severity of disease. And I know we, we've just actually are using EOS to look at our bariatric patients. But of course, these are patients that come in that are assessed, I would say, to death and to the extent that we collect a lot of data on them. So we can actually kind of stage them in terms of EOS. But actually, the general population, I would say, would be very difficult um, from a weight perspective, but even, but even maybe just a comorbidity profile as well. So again, good population level data, not very good for that sort of, you know, real specific provincial work. And, and Laura, I have a question. Since we're doing so much more work through virtual medicine now, we're getting all of the reports of weight and height is self, self, is self reported. I have not seen a patient for um, a, a year almost. Um, so it'll be coming on a year and we get around um, five to 500 new patients every month. So it's 500 self-reported initial heights and weights. When we first started the, 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 the pandemic, the very least I knew that I knew that I had some of their weights because they'd actually had come in. So I had some baselines, but now I don't have not even baselines. They tell me their height, they tell me their 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 own weight. Now you said that there is a calculation that we can kind of use to to get to what the real levels are at. Is that something that we're gonna start to use more so? Because I don't see us going back to getting more real weights and heights. I see this idea of self-reported stuff, which we can get on Noom apps, on all kinds of things. People are willing to give their information. It's not real, or it's not accurate but it's information, we can get it. Um, but we, we, to do a calculation to get to what the reality is, what, what is that? What do you see that happening or what is that calculation? Yeah, I mean, so the calculation was done by Statistics Canada a number of years ago. Um, it's based on all the data that they basically were collecting over time where they could look at self-report versus measure as that figure shows. I mean, it, there's a clear gap every single time and it's, it sort of seems yeah. to range between 15 and 30%. So I think we can, you know, this is a, it's a published calculation. There's a paper that's, that's published the formula. I mean, it's just a, a formula that you can use uh, for men and women, it's slightly different. Um, and it makes sense to use it because it does really then give you an idea of the real prevalence of obesity going forward. But I think you're right in terms of actual getting measures these days and the underreporting, you know, you, I guess you, you can just kind of make the assumption that you're always going to be underreporting the prevalence of obesity at a population level. I mean, at a patient level, it's now probably becoming more important as well. But to a certain extent, as you as we know through the guidelines, I mean, maybe, you know, the actual measure itself does not matter as much as the impairment on health. So, you know, does it really matter what the weight is? I mean, you know, to a certain extent, yes, I still think it does. Um, and I think those measures can be used in conjunction with a specific, you know, assessment by a clinician. Um, but again, we, we, you know, maybe that calculation should be used more uh, regularly when actually just determining the prevalence. And, and the issue there with determining prevalence often in, in any disease is really a health policy issue. You know, what is the burden in the population? Um, what do we need to be looking out for in terms of trends? I mean, if we started to see the prevalence of allergies increasing exponentially, if we started to see the prevalence of MS increasing exponentially, we might want to sit back and say, well, what do we need to do? What, what training, what resources, what money, what scarce resources need to be allocated? So, you know, I think the, the epidemiology piece of any disease is, is kind of always the evidence and feeding into some of the clinical piece, and they have to align, but they're different. Right. Right, right. No, that was super important. I really like that because we do talk to our patients and we tell them that we don't mind if you don't tell us what your weight is or you didn't get a weight. Um, uh, you know, it's nice to have some kind of starting ballpark, but certainly um, looking at your disease profile and what co comorbidities you have and what challenges you have, psychological aspects, we want to focus there. So I like your point about maybe um, from all the work that we've done, how much does it really matter on an individual basis? What matters is their behaviors and the relationship that 
um, the clinician has with the act with the, with the the uh, patient. I like that. Yeah, but definitely from a policy perspective, having that those data is very important, right? Because mm -hmm. you know we do this with any chronic disease, with any NCD, and this is a problem that we have in obesity, right? Because if we don't have really um, an assessment of the burden of obesity at the population level, then how do you allocate resources to such a serious chronic disease? And so I, I argue that we still need to collect mm -hmm. those, uh, those data for, for population health policy, um, but uh, we need to just be, be very careful how we explain to individual patients at the clinical level that this is really for the development of policies so that we can really advocate for the allocation of the adequate resources. Right, that's important. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. And I noticed that um, in the indigenous group, uh, so I was doing a presentation recently and I was trying to figure out what's the obesity burden within the different ethnic groups um, 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 within Canada. That's very hard to, to find. And even the, even, even the indigenous group, which you could think that they're um, isolated at times, you could be able to find that data. That's even difficult to go onto the reserves and find that data versus off-reserve. Off-reserve data we have more of, on-reserve data we have less of, which seems a little bit backwards almost. You would think that you'd be able to get more data, but there is a challenge here. So we, sh we should look towards, um, can we get the data? Can we provide the resources appropriately? If certain groups are having more of a burden of the condition and their, their, their condition is changing, it's rapidly going up and their disease burden is getting bigger, we need to put the resources in the right spot. So we do need this, this data. So Humana, you're absolutely right. So Ryan, uh, one of our participants has a question in the Q&A uh, and he's wondering if uh, you can provide any additional insight into why the prevalence rates are so much higher in certain provinces um, or even in sub-regions of, of Canada. Uh, yeah, so I guess um, and I've done, I did a bit of work on this a number of years ago when I, when I published a paper in 2014 that looked at the regional variations. And, and that was one of the things that drove me to write that paper actually was because, um, you know, just if you just look at the media, the media loves to sort of highlight the, the places that have the highest rates of obesity in Canada. And of course, I'm sitting in the province that does. So it tends to hit our uh, media quite a lot. Um, so I guess there's a couple of things I would say to that. One is... If you look at trends over time, you will find that actually some provinces kind of started almost from a different baseline in the 80s and have continued to increase. Well, say, for example, provinces like maybe Ontario, Quebec and BC were at a lower baseline, but they're actually increasing at pretty much the same rate. So we do like to say things like BC has got the lowest prevalence of obesity, appears to be the healthiest province in Canada, and, and for sure in terms of some of the chronic diseases and the prevalence of obesity, but their trend is upward. They're, they're, they don't have a trend that's also just sort of stopped or going flat. Um, their trend is increasing. So we'll yet to see, they might, somebody said to me when they looked at the data, they're basically just 20 years behind Newfoundland. So when it comes to that, they're still headed upwards. They haven't done enough in terms of interventions to say level the curve or stop it from increasing. So the starting point was always different. Um, when you look at the, the Atlantic provinces, for example, um, even though the rates are slightly different, there's really no significant difference between Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI when it comes to the prevalence and, and say the confidence interval around the prevalence. So there, that's kind of a region, it's, it's a sort of group. Um, whether that may be related to, for example, um, you know, potentially some, some socioeconomic status there. I mean, we, we certainly know in Canada that the, the, the provinces on the east versus moving towards the west, you're going from a gradient of, of certainly lower income provinces to higher income provinces traditionally, um, absolutely. Uh, there's some cultural differences for sure. Um, the east coast in particular, I would say Nova Scotia and Newfoundland are very much a Scottish and English descent. Um, a lot of the, the culture around that leads to a, a sort of a, a, a different uh, way of living, I would suggest, when I've been to other provinces. Um, I mean, there may be a genetic component. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no obvious things that sort of that stick out. Um, but, and again, what's interesting in Canada is that, you know, it's not a, just an east to west gradient. It's kind of an east 
then there's a blip, and then there's the West. Um, so Ontario and Quebec are a little bit lower, but then the Saskatchewan and Manitoba, the rates go up again, and then they go down a little bit in Alberta and go down a bit further in BC. Um, and the territories, and, and they're not all, you know, it's not all highly prevalent in the territories. So it's, you know, I think when we look at Canada, we really have to dig into the regions to see what's going on in the provinces um, to see, you know, what we can do in each province. And it may be, it may be different. Um, we may actually need a different approach in different provinces as to what to do, which leads to the complexity, but it's, it's what it is. And I'm wondering, Laurie, if I have a follow-up question to that one, is that, you know, if you talk about the percent increase, right, like BC is not stable, like right? they're going up and, you know, maybe they're going up faster rate than other provinces compared to uh, previous decades, but, um, is there an association perhaps, uh, are, are there any studies about, you know, the lack of access to obesity treatment in those provinces? And so if you have a province where there is no access to treatment, no access to bariatric surgery, no access to medications or interdisciplinary healthcare programs, uh, is that percent increase going to be higher in that province, for example? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I found interesting in just response to that comment is that when we did the obesity report cards published, you know, in the last couple of years, we've published two now to Obesity Canada. I knew what the situation was in, in the Atlantic provinces in terms of access to obesity treatments, which was very slim all around, whether it was medical, surgical, um, preventive, etc. It just wasn't on the radar here in terms of the healthcare system. But what I was quite shocked at was how little was going on in the rest of the country as well. So, I mean, every province really had a failing grade. I mean, an F for almost in every single intervention arm. Uh, obesity meds not covered by any province, very little interdisciplinary work. Yes, bariatric surgery in some provinces, but for any of us that are familiar with a bariatric surgery as a treatment or an intervention, um, you know, 1% of the eligible population will ever access bariatric surgery in Canada. It's not going to solve the obesity epidemic. Um, you know, based on the data that would be eligible in, in Newfoundland, 30,000 people could be eligible for bariatric surgery, and we do 150 a year. It's not going to solve that problem. Not that they'd all want surgery, mind you, but even those that do, it's, it's very inaccessible as a treatment. Um, interestingly as well, when you do have bariatric surgery, often your BMI is still over 30. Um, so again, you're still on, you're, you're still contributing to the prevalence of obesity, but your health risk has gone from that over 35, which is severe down to 30, which is, can be quite low as we know. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I don't, even that variability of access to treatment is, is a bit of an unknown, um, in terms of its impact on obesity across the province. I, I don't think that would be one of the defining pieces I have to say, based on the data I've looked at. Excellent. That's Lori. what I, I like that last statement, Lori, because that's what I think as well. I don't think that getting the access to treatment is going to help with the curve and where we're going to see the curve um, uh, go um, because um, our guidelines did not talk about prevention. We have uh, some mention on prevention and it was essentially we have no idea. We have almost no clue what to do to prevent it. Um, and um, I don't know where that data is going to come from. I don't believe it's going to come from, I think it'll partially come from science and some biological aspects. We know that genetics, we can look at the genetic code in an eight year old child mm -hmm. and then predict what they're, and this is just recent, this is over the past three years, we actually got that DNA data. And we can, we can then tell which child is going to struggle with elevated weight in the future. There's no way to stop it though. We know it, but we can't stop it. Now, so the question is going to be science is going to help us a little bit, but I believe social science is going to be what's really going to help that the pre 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 prevention prevention piece um, versus versus the treatment piece. But the inter interesting thing that I wanted to point out a little bit, I liked you talked about BMI and the, the waist circumference issues um, and measuring that. I wanted to highlight a little bit that that there's a big ethnic difference between measuring BMI and waist circumference in specific groups, um, just because um, it contributes to bias sometimes. African-American women can sustain much higher uh, weight ratios than, um, um, than women from the South Asian group or the, or the 
indigenous group. White women also can, can, uh, can sustain higher weight group. So their waist circumference can, can go up to a higher level before they start to get type two diabetes, meaning a BMI of almost 32. Whereas white males, for instance, waist circumference is a problem between a BMI of 25 and 30. So they're the ones getting cardiac catheterizations and heart conditions with between the BMI of 25 and 30. Whereas African-American women, it tends to take them all the way until a BMI of 35 before heart disease happens and, and diabetes happens. So we should look at people on an individual basis, recognizing that the BMI categories were not designed for South Asian women, um, um, black women, um, but were more so designed in the 1920s for insurance purposes that for white males. Um, so their risk at 20, BMI of 25 and 35 and 40, that all makes sense, but not for the African American woman. We would have started our, our obesity categories at a different level at BMI of 35, we'd push everything up. And for South Asian women, we push everything down. So I, I think that ethnic uh, aspect is important. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I, I didn't include all of that in the presentation. But I mean, if you just look back to 15 years, between 15 and 20 years ago, obesity in Canada was also defined as a BMI greater than 27. There was early data on the Framingham Heart Studies. Um, and a lot of the, the early data actually, in fact, quite a few published papers, which, which then make it difficult for comparisons, actually, you know, define obesity as greater than 27. And then that was all moved up. And I mean, these were these were criteria that came from the WHO, which again, were primarily representing white people in the world. Um, and there was a discussion even at that time um, as to what thresholds to go with based on the evidence around, you know, things like all cause mortality, um, what sort of, you know, the ranges we should use. So the ranges aren't perfect. And I guess this even speaks to more the power of the guidelines, which is, you know, it's it's not about a BMI of 22 or 31 or 26 or 42. It's actually what what is impacting? How is your 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 body fat in particular impacting your health? Um, and so the data is very useful. You know, we need the data to do research. And I know when we started the guidelines you know, with, with the focus moving away from BMI and waist circumference, I remember having the conversation and numerous times with the committee, which is the issue is that all the research uses BMI and waist circumference. So what do we do? We have to use the research to inform what we're doing. You know, we have to talk about the limitations, but it, it doesn't mean we throw that stuff out. Um, there are still very good associations between BMI and waist circumference, waist circumference in particular around cardiovascular. Um, diseases and events, absolutely. Um, and we also do know that actually a large proportion of people, probably between 75 and 95%, who say have BMIs greater than 35 and 40, also have other chronic conditions. Mm. You know, it's it's not the norm not to have chronic conditions once you get to those BMI levels. So it is useful, but not as a defining feature of obesity when somebody walks into a clinic and gets weighed and and has their height done and, and they're told they've got a BMI of 35. It doesn't mean anything. Um, we need to just use it to go forward, but it's not a defining feature. Laurie, I'm just really curious in the work that you've been doing, um, have you been paying attention with the impact of COVID-19 mm. on obesity prevalence? Do we have any data on that yet? And what's your thought about the impact of this pandemic on this other twin pandemic of obesity? Mm. I mean, I have, I've reviewed a few papers, um, actually, which is, which have been interesting. Related, I mean, obviously, obesity is coming out as a, a defining feature in terms of COVID-19 is predispos predisposing people who develop COVID-19 to be at a higher risk. Um, it seems like more people are dying in the higher BMI categories with COVID-19. Um, the, I think what they're, they're sort of purporting is around, for example, things related to inflammation um, in the body related to COVID-19 being more predisposing. Obviously all the clustered comorbidities that come with being in the higher BMI levels. Um, I mean, I think even the research around, you know, the flus and even SARS was, was affected people with obesity more. 
So I think, you know, your, your, your health profile, whether it's metabolic or systemic, I mean, you're, 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 you're obviously immunocompromised to some point when it comes to having a number of other comorbidities as well as high inflammation markers. When we test the CRP levels in our bariatric surgery patients before surgery, they are off the, you know, they're at the top of the roof and they come down in that first year significantly to almost the normal range of a C-reactive protein level. So, you know, I think those are the, some of the science links that people are purporting may be related to, as, as well as things like sleep apnea and, and breathing um, in terms of compromisation there. So, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I've read some articles, I'm following it. We've had some webinars on obesity and COVID-19 that I've attended. Um, but I certainly think when, it's, when the data comes out in, in a few, you know, it's going to be a while before we actually look back on this. I think we will see a higher number of people with obesity who will have died with COVID-19. What about your thoughts about will COVID-19 cause more obesity in the city? So I was on a radio show um, where they really wanted to push this. It was a Leger poll, one of those, it's they, you know, they, they do this internet poll where they ask a couple of people, how have you, has, has your weight gone up? Are you eating worse? Are you eating more carbs? What I was fascinated by, and I'll give you my kind of bias, was that almost 60% of people were maintaining weight, which was shocking in the COVID pandemic when they're at home, they're more challenged. And then they showed that um, uh, uh, 20% had an increased weight and like 15% had decreased weight or something like that, right? But I was shocked that anybody, that, that more people had stable weight than had an increasing weight. And to me, it looked like the percentages of people that have increased and decreased weight and stable weight all the time. Um, but um, they were really pushing that everyone's weight is going up. Obesity is going to be a major, major issue because of COVID. And maybe that's true. Maybe that is going to happen. But I, I wasn't convinced with this little poll that that was the case. What are your thoughts as to what's going to happen? Uh, I also agree, Sean. I have not seen the, I mean, I haven't seen any data, um, but just, just from what you're reading and, and what's in the news and what you're experiencing, I would, my, if somebody had asked me, I would have said, I think people will be maintaining or potentially losing weight. I mean, yes, there are a small number of people, the media loves to jump on that, um, you know, kind of COVID-19 causing everybody to, to gain weight, but I have not also seen a lot of evidence to suggest that's happening. In fact, I'm seeing the opposite. Um, in, in our province in particular, I'm seeing higher levels of activity, um, more people out walking. Yes, they might be on their own. I've seen, you know, we, we were involved in a, in a small bike project over the summer, um, uh, sort of uh, collecting and giving out bikes to newcomer families from Syria. And the bike shop basically just said, bikes are flying off the shelves. We are probably have a two year wait list and it's not even because we can't get them from China. It's just people have taken something up. I've had people walk in and say, I haven't been on a bike for 25 years, but I'm gonna start. Um, the same with walking and exercise and the virtual, the virtual exercise world has absolutely exploded um, with people doing things at home. So much so that a lot of places even in our city are, are not going back to in person. The virtual reality world has been so positive for people. And what's interesting here, actually, and, and this just sort of combines a bit of research and experience, which is where I'm involved at the moment with a, a study where we're, it's an exercise and infertility study, where it's actually the title of the study is Moving Beyond BMI. So it's, it's women who have BMIs over 30 who are actually attending fertility services clinic here because they're, they're finding it difficult to get pregnant. And they're going to be enrolled in a clinical trial where they're actually going to follow a 12 week exercise program, specifically based around HITS, the HITS program, kind of high intensity, sort of, uh, so exercise related to heart rate zone, et cetera. Um, and some early research, there's literally two studies that have been done on this, one in Sweden and one in Quebec, which looks at the metabolic profile changes with the exercise that, that trains people in a high heart rate zone for a short period of time. So if you can imagine people who are living with obesity, you know, you're not talking about being on a treadmill for half an hour or jumping jacks, but even exercises that just move body weight, whether it's standing jumping jacks or, or squats where they're just up and down raises the heart rate enough to be in a high intensity zone. Um, and that has now moved to a virtual program. So it was meant to be done in, in, in person at a gym. And we've had to move it virtually because we can't do research in person at the moment. 
And I suspect we will have, I, I can already tell because people have called, um, we will have more people enrolling, but people happier to do it in their own home. People, especially living with severe obesity, as many of us know, are not the people you see in gyms. They're not the people you see in places where the rest of you know the world that might be active or fit are. Gyms are full of fit, active people. They're not full of people yeah. who, who might want to access the service. And I see that virtual world as being huge for people who want to and are motivated to actually exercise and do things in their own home. And I think this study is going to show it, but I think on a general level, what an amazing opportunity to develop that virtual programming for people who, who don't feel comfortable, but eventually will. Um, and I just think that's a big space that we're headed towards. And I, I also think that many people have taken the pandemic as an opportunity to get fit um, and actually look at their diet and reevaluate, reflect. So we might be pie in the sky optimists, but I'm, I'm thinking the same. I, I think that many people have actually gone the other way, not what the media likes to say is, you know, you're sitting inside watching Netflix. And yes, there's lots of that going on too. But right. I do think the, the majority of people have, have looked at their health. I bought a bike, Lori. I have a Peloton, uh, an exercise bike. I do a Peloton. I'm doing more exercise than I did before. Yeah. So that's, that's all your data that you need. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> one is perfect. Listen, listen, guys, I could sit here and talk with you guys all day. And I think we've uh, had such a fun discussion. Lori, thanks a million for the fantastic presentation. And Jimena, Sean from... Uh, the distance joining in for the panel. It's been really great. And thanks to all the participants. Um, so really, uh, yeah, and, and Ryan's giving a little bit of a shout out here in the chat box to everybody. So thanks a million, everybody, and looking forward to connecting with you guys next time. And yeah, what are we going to do to implement these guidelines? You know, just got to keep on with this. Okay. Right so next, on. Take care, everybody.